we are. We've got Alex and Alan uh, from Unbound Tech, right? Okay, so uh, Alex is a sales director. Uh, he's uh, spent his entire career in high tech, initially designing and documenting trading and business systems architecture and now working as a solutions provider. And Alan is a solutions architect. Uh, he brings over 20 years of hands-on experience, security experience, spanning application, web-based, wireless, and network technology. So gentlemen, I'll leave it up to you. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, so a little background really quickly. Uh, Alex and I uh, work in the crypto field, and we've had this conversation over and over for the past several months about poor crypto hygiene. So you've heard about security hygiene, and uh, crypto hygiene is a little bit more specific. It's about good practices associated with crypto-based solutions. And um, what we've come to realize is uh, really two things. One, there's typically two foci, or pair of foci, uh, when you talk about crypto. There are the folks who um, create the algorithms and do the coding and deal with the bits and bytes and get their PhD, you know, those like 10 people in the world that all of the textbooks are written for. And then there are the folks who have to take advantage of those crypto uh, functions and effectively are told by their vendor, click this button, use this, and we have a high level understanding of what's happening, but not necessarily the drivers or good practices around it. And we, we want to sort of bridge that, that gap a little bit operationally. Um, and the other one is that, and this goes with the theme of the conference, that um, technology is touching us everywhere. So, you know, we've heard talks about, uh, or that involved uh, the use of smart assistants at home, uh, about uh, smart wearables, our tablets, our phones, but the reality is there, there's very, very le little that you do during the day that, that doesn't touch technology and, and privacy in some way. Um, folks who have uh, pacemakers, right, those are typically Bluetooth enabled and now they're actually becoming Wi-Fi enabled, IP enabled, so that doctors can adjust them remotely, right, through telemedicine functions. Um, insulin pumps, most of those these days are NFC or Bluetooth enabled. Folks have uh, all sorts of sensors in their, in, their, in their shoes, in their scales. And so whether we know it or not, um, we're touching on, on security concerns, best practices, and we wanna sort of share experientially what we've seen for operators, but also for you guys to share with your customers, the folks that, that you need to support. So Alex will sort of uh, set the, 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 the groundwork here and then I'll, I'll dive down. Yeah, perfect. So we, we are always relegated to the after lunch session, uh, which is challenging, as, as you can imagine, which means we're probably not too good at, at what we're doing. But we've done our best to make it a little bit entertaining. So uh, any, his, uh, any movie buffs out there, you might recognize uh, what we've modeled our, our presentation after. So we kind of use a little bit of a storytelling framework. A little bit more context around to what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, in addition to that introduction, is I'm working with companies from some, some that are even pre-capital, pre-launch, to some of the biggest organizations in the world, um, financial institutions, universities, things of this nature. And what that affords me is, is a, a broad range of insights into the industry and the digital, the digital ecosystem. I started out with a little more of a networking security and security generalist background and moved deep, deep down this, this rabbit hole of, of cryptography, um, and, and I love it. And, and to bring it back to the theme of living in, in the cyber world and the comments that Alan mentioned, I'd go so far as to say that we, we live in a crypt, cryptographic world. The, the challenge is that most people aren't fully aware of that. So we're working to bring awareness to both systems operators and consumers of technology uh, around these, this idea of, of crypto hygiene and crypto best practices. So I'll cover um, some of the more high level topics and then Alan will dive into some of the more uh, actionable items that we like to share. So ultimately, and I'm gonna come down here, but ultimately what we like to do is, is map uh, the, the takeaways to, to items and, and talk tracks you can bring to, to your leadership and to your organization that can be implemented today uh, in a way that resonate, resonates at, at a decision-making decision -making level. So we'll, we'll talk about some of these items and, and bring things full circle and then leave hopefully plenty of time for, for Q&A. And if anyone has any questions while we're running through this, please uh, interrupt us. So I'm sure everyone in the room is aware of NIST and what they do. And just to mention the concept of having a framework and standards around best practices, uh, the NIST 800 suite is formulated towards best practices for securing info systems. And within that suite, there's recommendations and guidelines specific to 
proper key security, cryptographic key security and key management. You know, that's the umbrella term that we give uh, crypto hygiene to. So we'll, as we talk through some specific items, we'll map them back to each, uh, each corner of the, the triumvirate. It's kind of interesting you know, when we talk to, to clients and, and contributors in the field that from an from a encryption and a cryptography standpoint, people think of, oh, confidentiality, right? It's, it's, it's secret. But the, the interesting thing that, that I'll talk about a little bit later is how cryptography can be an enabler of all elements of the framework, including availability of information systems and integrity of that information as well. So we started out with a, a visual on, on movie, uh, of a movie in Crypto 101. Um, you know, some people think the movie's better than the book, the book's better than the movie, so we're giving you a little bit of both. And here's a couple of just key takeaways if you remember nothing else from this talk at a conceptual level, just, just uh, give some consideration to the following slides, right? There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of tools and options and security uh, alternatives in the market. Uh, cryptography is not a fix-all, right? We're not, we're not up here saying that this is a magic bullet to, to anything by, by any means, right? And it's actually quite a complex area of information security, too. Uh, so it's, it's not a magic bullet, and, and anyone who, and I'm a vendor, right, a vendor, and this is not a vendor fest, but any vendor who's, who stands in front of you and says, hey, we can solve all your problems, right, that the BS meter goes off. Cryptography, in fact, is a tool, and we were having a conversation at lunch, I think, there they are, uh, around, <laughs> uh, it was actually the Ionian Revolution in 5th century BC, so I refresh my memory on these details, and how steganography, which is essentially a form of cryptography, was used to communicate a hidden message by tattooing it on someone's the back of their head and letting their hair grow out so that they could only read the message once the hair was shaved at a later, later point in time, right? That's certainly a tool, right? Are you going to tattoo your PII data to the, to the back of your, your head, right? <laughs> your, your social security number? Probably not. So, so there's a number of, uh, of modern tools and modern cryptography that we're leveraging and, and I want everyone to remember that, that it is a tool and like any tool, it needs to be used properly. Right, so, so I think Alan talks a little bit later about the concept of bringing a, a, a knife to a gunfight, a, a gun to a knife fight, and a, a gun to an oil fire. So we'll give you a little bit more detail, but again, just remember that just like any tool, cryptography is quite powerful, but it has to be used, it has to be used uh, correctly. An interesting talk track uh, for people who are in the cyber community and then comparing that to people who aren't is this idea of secure. So. Um, SSL encryption, it's happening right on your website. It's encrypted, we're good, right? En encryption's secure. That's the general belief and consensus um, you know, in, in popular science and, and from the general population and demographic. But the fact of the matter is that doesn't really mean anything until you start to peel back the details. So of course encryption is a best practice. And in fact, what, what I've witnessed in my short lifetime is a, a zeitgeist across industries and verticals, I think starting probably was in, in healthcare and financial services where I first observed it, uh, towards this idea of encrypt everything, right? That's how we're protecting data. But there's implications to performance and availability, right, that we talk about from the, from the NIST framework. And um, those are things that are important to consider. So ultimately, encryption is a tool, as I mentioned, uh, but that doesn't mean we're secure. So, so cryptography is a form of math, and the way that, that mathematicians think of security is security as a function of time, right? It's not a binary outcome. It's a matter of how long do you want to protect information? Now, in wartime messaging, when uh, the, you, know, you were to issue a, a wartime message and within several day, hours, days, or weeks, uh, that, that message was potentially irrelevant because the because the, the conditions had changed, then, then the cryptography only needs to be so long to support that time frame. But if you're subject to certain compliance uh, situations, like um, if you're performing research under CUI, or if you're protecting patient information under HIPAA, and you have requirements to protect this data for three, five, seven, ten 10 years, then there need to be controls and cryptographic and controls that can defend against these types of timelines. So ultimately, if you put yourself in the executive decision-making shoes, it's, hey, is it going to cost me more to protect or to incur loss, right? So, when, so from, from a vendor standpoint, that's the conversation I'm dealing with on a daily basis is, hey, is it worth investing in what we do? And from a, from a cyber and a crypto framework standpoint, these are the decisions that need to be made based on risk management, risk threshold, risk policy within the organization, right? 
The, the biggest takeaway to how we think about information security systems from a cryptography stand standpoint is, is Kirchhoff's principle. And for those who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's paraphrased here. And essentially what August Kirchhoff stated is that a crypto system should be secure even if everything about the system except the key is public knowledge. Now, I don't want you to think of availability of a system uh, for general use as a bad thing. It's actually good, right? We talk a lot of times about InfoSec as an inhibitor versus an enabler. And are we no men and no women or yes men and, no wi and yes women, right? We, we, we want the system to be available. It just has to be secure as well. So the idea is that if you're able to secure the keys to the encrypted system, then that system should be and can be secure, but also available. So, so bringing it back to the, the triumvirate that, that I outlined from, from NIST 800. We're gonna act out a little story together. And if anyone's looked at Khan Academy, Crypto 101, right, these, I see someone laughing, right? These are the traditional players, Alice, Bob, and Eve. This is how, how you know, encry encryption process and operations are often illustrated. Alice! Oh my God, Bob, I can't believe this is happening. I love you. Oh, my heart. That's great, but wait a second. Are those your, I have a pointer on here. Are those your private keys? What the hell? I, I'm not very good at this. To continue the movie theme, nothing spreads like keys. What we'll talk about is, this, is the scariest thing about this is the fact that if someone has access to your cryptographic system and your private keys in particular, essentially they have uh, authority and access to that system and they can use it without the system operator's knowledge. So we, you know, the, nothing spreads like contagion if you, rec if you recognize this movie headline starring Ar August Kirchhoff, right, one of our, one of our idols. It's, it's interesting, when, you, when, when I started paying attention to the space, I didn't realize how prevalent incidences were, right? And, and one of the things that we're trying to educate the market and society on is this concept of cryptography as an enabler and how important it is to living in a cyber world and then the theme that we've discussed. Um, it's, really, it's really interesting to, to see the number of, of incidences that are related specifically to poor, it, poor crypto hygiene, improper crypto hygiene. And specifically, um, we, we believe that the only way to bring awareness to this topic, and it's an important one, is, is there's essentially two things that are happening, right? There's, there's a deep, deep technical community who's focused on, on looking at this and understanding this, and then there's compelling events, right? Things that make, whoa, the headlines. Uh, these are from, it was a month ago? Uh, the last month or so, we pulled these all together, you know, generally available on the web. Uh, some, really, you know, some really interesting uh, crypto hygiene issues that, that are uh, coming to light. You know, most recently, we see, okay, Windows 10 is issuing a passwordless experience, right? There's no password. You just use a key. It's on a, it's on a hardware key that you carry around with you, right? So is that good hygiene? You know, may, maybe, maybe not, right? I don't think we, we have a perfect world right now. But back to the concept of, of the compelling event, the, the event's only compelling to, to leadership and, and board, board decision makers if there's financial implications, right? That's what our incentive system's based on. So um, as a way of bringing awareness to this topic without you know, furthering compelling events, we're trying to educate uh, by taking a deeply technical topic and bringing it to that 101 level, hence the, the, the title of our slide. So why do we care? Why should you as security educators and practitioners care? I love the fact that uh, Bob and the team built this conference with the sole intention around education. Uh, I think that's really important to furthering our cyber community. And we have this great pool of resources, being the student body at UW and, and across the country and across the world, uh, to help educate people on something that actually, as you learn more about, about it, it's really, really exciting. Or, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm a little nerdy, but to us, it, it really is. So, bottom line, all cryptography relies on secrets. There's a number of operations that are, are listed here I'll spare from reading to you. And if the keys to your kingdom are compromised, it collapses. We're you know, living in this cyber apocalypse. Someone called this my zombie slide once. 
Once a secret is stolen, all security is lost. And sure, right, there's, there's denial of service attacks and, and, and other types of incidences where, oh my God, we're being breached, what do we do about it? Uh, but the scariest ones are, oh my God, I was infiltrated two years ago and there was data being exfiltrated over a period of time. So with, with cryptography and those who manipulate uh, cryptographic controls to gain access to systems, specifically through private keys, they can use those systems without being detected. And to us, that's the really scary part, and that's what we're, we're helping customers and, and educating the market on how we help defend against that. So, without further ado, I will hand things off to my very well-groomed technical counterpart, Mr. Konar. Thank you. All right, so um, as this is a crypto hygiene uh, conversation, we figured we would tie it to grooming habits uh, something very near and dear to me. Uh, so we will break this down, hopefully in a way that makes sense. Uh, recommendation number one for anyone who needs to support crypto operations or anything cryptographically based, use as directed, right? Just like with your mouthwash. If you think about it, uh, what Alex had mentioned earlier about bringing a knife to a gunfight, and by the way, I'm a big fan of XKCD. That's why you, this is the second comic you've seen here. Uh, we all think, why would you bring a knife to a gunfight? You're, 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 you're in deep, I'll just say deep. Um, but if you bring a gun to a gunfight or a gun to a knife fight, you're great. But what about an oil fire, right? Is the gun really the solution for an oil fire? Is water the solution for the oil fire? The reality is this, is that cryptography isn't gonna solve your problems. The proper implementation, management, administration, all the things that you're responsible for uh, are gonna be equally important, actually I would say more important than the crypto that underlies it. As a perfect example, uh, common tactic, and this goes back to another thing that Alex has said about uh, how long does something have to remain secret, a common tactic is to capture data and then offline take as much time as you need to, to, to work your way through that data. Very commonly with passwords, folks reuse passwords across sites and, and some sites do really poor hashing, some don't do hashing, some do salting. You might have uh, password hints, actually there's an XKCD comic all about that but I refrained from putting it there. Um, and having those multiple data sets together allow you offline to work your way through those sets of passwords. So the reality is that um, something as simple in the Snowden context as perfect forward secrecy would have helped. So the use of a brand new session key for every interaction rather than a singular session key across the, the whole session. That's just good practice. We're with the government and we're here to help you. Normally that makes you quake in your boots. I understand this. But in this case, uh, our friends at NIST, again, something Alex mentioned, uh, provide this 800 series, series of recommendations in part uh, because the government relies more and more on third party vendors and educational partners in order to provide protections. This is a really good place to begin. And there was a, a fascinating presentation earlier about uh, using the NIST 800 series framework in order to, to, to develop your series of processes and, and, and checks, but I'll just mention that there. So here's an example, right? Instantpayroll.com. I, I don't know what they do. I didn't actually look them up. They were just the first that I, I came up with with this uh, SL Labs tool. But you'd imagine they probably deal with, uh, with money. I mean, payroll, right? So you can run this web-based tool against uh, web-based applications, websites at a bare minimum, and it will come back with a grading on uh, the implementation of your TLS, SSL, TLS, HTTPS, whatever you want to call it. So in this case, they're using Nginx and, and they're using the latest version of code and everything is wonderful except, oh, <laughs> they've enabled some weak ciphers and they've actually prioritized a strong cipher as the first, but that doesn't guarantee that the client will choose that cipher in the interaction. And further, they haven't disabled a function which makes them vulnerable to the poodle attack. So, you know, these guys think they're, they're doing great. They, they installed Nginx, they enabled, enabled SSL, their website is wonderful, but this is just a practical application. It's not a fire and forget. This is something that you need to keep up with. I'll guarantee you, you know, uh, after Poodle, the, there was then the, the, the zombie Poodle attack and then the re-Poodle and a handful of others that were technically related. So this is an ongoing effort. That's probably not news to you guys. This is what you do all day, every day. But this is an application or administrative function here, right? Ensuring that, that, uh, that you're keeping up with 
um, the, uh, the, the bits and bytes of, of maintaining your internal systems. Number two, don't roll your own. So we presented this for the first time in Denver, right? So that didn't go over very well. You can imagine everyone was rolling their own, some in the audience, because I, I drone on sometimes. But don't roll your own, right? Depend on the professional. Crypto's hard, man. It is, it really is. Folks wouldn't have to get PhDs if it wasn't hard. It, it takes a long time to develop secure ciphers. It takes a long time to test them, to work out all the bugs. NIST right now is going through a process of trying to figure out post-quantum crypto ciphers. Ciphers that are secure against quantum computing, right? Because depending on who you ask, you have to worry about it tomorrow because I'm a vendor and I'll sell you something that's safe tomorrow. Or it's something five or 10 years down the road, which is probably more realistic. But again, remember, how long do we have to keep our data safe? Right? If quantum computing becomes a reality, we get quantum supremacy in five to 10 years, data from today is probably still covered under HIPAA or GDPR, right? So you do have to consider this today. And it's hard, it's really, really hard. Um, there's more that happens in proving out these protocols than in developing them, right? So generally when we're talking about these protocols, uh, and I'll, I'll focus on asymmetric encryption, what folks call public key encryption, generally um, they are algorithmically based. Someone can present you the math present you a mathematical proof, and those mechanisms are considered secure for however long it is that uh, you're able to, uh, you're not able to break it faster than you could break it brute force, right? So you hear, oh, it'll take 10 times the lifetime of the universe to break X. Well, from a propeller head perspective, the folks in, in, in the ivory towers, the reality is that if you can come up with a mechanism that makes it 2% faster, it's now considered broken crypto, 2% faster than brute force. Because everything, once you can attack it al algorithmically, you, you're just gonna continue to refine those functions. So the, the, the reality is, is that you can provide these mathematical proofs. That's what makes this interesting. As opposed to unproven protocols. When someone comes up to you and they say, um, I have this way of encrypting this thing that's magic. I can't tell you how it works, so I'd be giving up my secrets, but this protocol is so much better than what you're dealing with, than EDCSA, than RSA, than whatever you use day to day. It is better, trust me. When a vendor says, trust me, you need to hide your kids. That's the thing to remember. So um, why am I focusing on this? Well, all software has flaws. It just, it, it does. Right? You will find bugs in everything. Whether you're talking about your routers and your switches, your iPhone, your wearable, your scale, it doesn't matter. All software has bugs. And those bugs are more likely to be discovered the more widely the software is used. That's just a reality. The more eyes there are on, uh, on something, the greater the chance that you'll find a vulnerability. And that is sort of the core of public crypto, of crypto as, it, as, as it's viewed today, is that the more eyes you get on it, the greater the chance that we'll find a vulnerability, a challenge, and it'll be addressed, it'll be fixed. Um, that's not gonna change. In fact, it's going to get worse because we, de uh, we depend on underlying operating systems that might sit across multiple hardware types, right? So uh, folks who use routers and switches might see that that um, they have VxWorks at the core as a real-time OS. Some folks are using some variants of Linux as real-time OSs. We see Windows, Mac OS, Symbian, whatever. Those OSs have problems, and there are very many cases where we're dependent on functions from those OSs. Um, it was just revealed, for example, that OpenSSL, which is at the core of a huge amount of crypto functions that we deal with, uh, has uh, an issue in um, testing the relative primality of, of, of a given integer, right? It, it, it was just discovered that it's not so good at doing that. Uh, and that's being fixed, right? Because there are a lot of eyes on OpenSSL. So uh, it's not gonna change, it's just gonna get worse. And the answer isn't to run away and hide, the answer is to have more eyes looking at this. Um, considering this, the important thing to, to keep in mind is uh, how hard is it gonna be to find this, how many eyes are looking at it, and how hard is it to recover? So if you find a problem with Mac OS, chances are that Apple will fix it in their next patch. If there's a problem found in Android, chances are Google will fix it in their next patch, and then six months later it'll be pushed to Samsung, right, that's running Google. 
uh, if you're running a piece of firmware with some exotic real-time OS, or not so exotic like VxWorks, let's say, then chances are that it takes a lot more work to update that firmware. For one, for one thing, you, you have a much more limited resource environment, resource-constrained environment. So, so what happens with the code is, is, uh, is that it's much more difficult to make changes, but also just the, the process of updating that firmware. And, and I'll talk about a, another much more specific case uh, in a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, you want to know that there are a lot of eyes on whatever it is that you're going to use, whatever it is that you're going to uh, depend on. All right. So uh, I'll give a couple of examples. White box crypto was very popular for DRM. Right? It was the case where you would have your cryptographic protocols and keys all obfuscated inside the code because that's the only way you can handle offline DRM. Right? You couldn't reach out to a server to, to figure stuff out. So it was embedded there. And some folks figured, hey, that's, that's a great security solution. We'll, we'll embed the key, and then we can just push the same exact key out to millions of users, and it'll be obfuscated, it'll be hidden, it'll, it'll be mixed up. Nobody will figure it out. Wonderful. So uh, there was this competition in 2017, uh, the Y Box contest, where they invited bunches of vendors to uh, bring their white box solutions and allow researchers and practitioners to attack those white box solutions. Right again, white box, someone telling you, trust me, my stuff is cool. No, you can't look at the code. No, you can't look at mathematical proofs. No, it's just us who looked at it, but trust me. Remember what that means when a vendor says it. So what happened? <laughs> Every single one of the implementations, all 94 of them, were broken. The majority of them were broken within the first day, and the one that lasted the longest was 28 days, about a month. A month before it was broken. And by the way, it was broken by somebody who was not a crypto specialist, who was just noodling around. They wanted to participate in this because it would be fun. 28 days. Brush up on your basics, right? So it's not enough that, that you use as directed, but you also have to brush up on your basics. You have to understand when someone tells you, use CBC mode versus this mode, use whatever mode versus whatever mode. You don't have to know the bits and the bytes. Who cares what's big endian and, and, and who cares? What you do care about is what's the logic behind those sets of recommendations. Why are you being led to click this box instead of that box? So in the case of cryptography, the reality is that the most vulnerable component will be your private key. It doesn't matter if you're talking symmetric or asymmetric cryptography. You can know everything else about the system. But as long as you keep that key safe, you, you should be in good shape. But, but again, that key is just a really long prime number. So it doesn't mean that just because I have it in my back pocket, I'm OK. Someone can continue guessing it. Just because it might take 10 times the lifetime of the universe to guess it doesn't mean I won't guess it on the second try. Right? That's a statistical approximation. I could guess it on the second try. Uh, in fact, we're getting better and better at uh, breaking certain kinds of crypto versus other kinds of crypto. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that there's a life cycle associated with any given key. So it's not just the generation you have to care about. It's also the protection, the renewal, the distribution. That's the big boogeyman, the distribution. Uh, backup, recovery, revocation, destruction, so on and so forth. That, that whole life cycle you need to track. Um, there should be a usage policy. This is where our friends in the government come back. NIST has uh, some really decent guidelines to follow in terms of lifespan of keys. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm accelerating, but apparently I've been chewing up my time. Uh, four, keep it clean, right? You want to make sure that you know what keys are out there, where they are, and who has them. Now, we deal day to day typically with really large financial organizations and and healthcare and, and, and software development organizations. And we've gone to those organizations and implemented some, some structure around their, their key lifecycle to have them find that there are actually sets of certificates and keys they never even knew existed. They had no clue. These have been ordered through the finance office, delivered to a developer, and maybe that developer left, or they stopped using it, or they only used it twice, or they gave it to a friend, or they printed it out and put it on a t-shirt, who knows. But just knowing what's out there and knowing who keeps it and developing processes around who should have access to it and when they should have access to it, that's probably your greatest priority right there and the biggest challenge. Alex had mentioned HTTPS. 99% uh, of the time, you bring up a web server, you enable HTTPS using uh, Apache, Nginx, whatever. 
your private keys for, and your, your certificate for, uh, for HTTPS is typically no more than a couple of directories away from the content you're serving. That seems like a really terrible idea, right? I'm gonna put this box here with my gold in it and I'm gonna take the key and I'm just gonna put it under this rock right over here next to it. I don't think anyone would do that in real life, right? Why do we care, right? Someone has to break into that server to get access to that key. Sure, you know, and once they've broken into the server, they can deface your web page and all that fun stuff, but we're not talking about websites in the mid-90s here. We're talking about web applications. The majority of, of, of applications that you use, even on your phone, are web-based applications. They're HTML5, they're JavaScript, they're using Ajax. Um, they're using effectively much the same technology as when you're delivering it from Nginx to a browser. So if someone can gain access to those keys, they can take them and walk away from them and you'll never know that they have them until they start intercepting your traffic or redirecting your traffic. Or you might even never find out about it. We've had organizations that have gone two years. I'll give you a perfect example of this that you saw in the news. Asus, for two years, did not realize that their keys had been compromised, their code signing keys. So the software that was used to update the BIOS in your laptop, to update the uh, drivers for the hardware in your laptop, they had no control over. They don't know if it was their stuff or someone else's stuff. The only thing that saved them is that whoever, was, was, uh, whoever the bad actor was was targeting a set of MAC addresses. So targeting some set of, of uh, users based on devices in, in, in the laptops. But, but still, I mean, that's horrifying. And they're not the only case. Same things happen to D-Link. Actually, I have the, the, the house is burning slide coming up in a second. So you know, it's sitting a couple of directories up from your content. That's awful. Or what about in a Java key store on, on, on your machine? You know, great, someone has to figure out a password in order to access the JKS and extract the keys, right? I'm secure now. Well, again, if they can copy that JKS, that key store, off of your machine, then they can attack it offline. At will. You'll never know. It's on a thumb drive. We had a story of someone who was, um, who was uh, dealing with cryptocurrency and they used the thumb drive to have the key for their cryptocurrency, and they left it in Sherpol Airport in Amsterdam. Now, they're not terribly worried that someone's gonna pick it up and steal their five Bitcoin, but they are worried because they can't do anything with that cryptocurrency. That, that key is on that, on that thumb drive somewhere. This goes back to those best practices. Make sure you have a backup of that key. They were really secure. They kept it offline in, in a cold vault on a USB stick in his pocket. Um, Unsecured on a shared machine. This is a great one. Do you guys remember the uh, attack on the uh, Iraqi nuclear plant? This is that example. Someone walked in to a company, into J Micron, plugged a USB stick into their build machine, copied the signing key for their code, pulled it out, walked away. And they were nice enough to turn the lights off as they left, because whoever was there left them on and you know, it was going to burn through their electricity bill. But they, they, they took that key and they used it to sign firmware that was then used in those, factor, in the, uh, in those nuclear facilities to, to overrun the uh, centrifuges to cause the meltdown. Literally, all they had to do was learn to lockpick. You can do that right outside the lockpick village. Plug in a USB stick and copy something. So very, very important. Know where your assets are. This one's a little controversial. Don't drop the key. You don't want to be the one that drops the key. Why? Well, we talked about this. Your keys are your keys to your kingdom. When you're doing database protection, you're encrypting your database, the common ways of doing that today are TDE, uh, or is TDE. So Microsoft comes to you, Oracle comes to you, MongoDB comes to you, and they say, enable TDE and your data is protected, you're good. That's data at rest, by the way. It's encrypted when it's written to disk. When it's in use, it sits in memory. Right? So you know, anyone who can gain access to that memory can gain access to that data. Further, anyone who can gain access to the key that was used, either to encrypt the data or to encrypt the key that was used to encrypt the data, can gain access to that data. Right? So you know, we're talking about protecting data. You have to remember that the key is the key to this. Um, Who's been hit by it? I've mentioned a few of these, right? J Micron, uh, really great one was Sinizer. They delivered software for their headphones, right? You figure, great, I mean, what am I worried about? Software for headphones. It had their root CA inside of the software. So anyone could pull it out and generate certificates and keys that were legitimately Sinizers. 
You can imagine what you could do with that, the amount of traffic you could redirect. Uh, Adobe, someone had gotten into their build server. They didn't even need to grab the key. They just needed access to it for a function. They used it to sign code and push it out because their distribution system wasn't protected. So far, we've been talking about protecting these keys, encrypting stuff, but it only works if on the receiving side, on the consumer side, your customers care about that enforcement. So when they install a piece of software in Microsoft and it says, this comes from an unknown provider, do you want to do this, yes or no? The answer should be no. <laughs> we need to get them to understand that. For folks who are getting into microservices, typically Dockerized, you know, Docker uh, containerized microservices, Docker implemented the, the, the update framework, tough. It's disabled by default. You have to ensure that your consumers enable it if you want to provide this protection. So as important as it is to not drop the key, it's important to ensure that users are aware that they need to take advantage of these services. And I'm not going to belabor you know, the fact that you have all of these keys being lost. And by the way, it's not just bad actors. It's not the guy in the hoodie who's pulling the Mr. Robot. right? More often than not, if you're using cloud services, it's the dude who's on service at 3 in the morning who misconfigured something by mistake. And all of a sudden, your database is sitting outside of a secure perimeter. By the way, anyone who believes in a perimeter today, we should talk afterwards. The, the reality is that your data is everywhere, whether you like it or not. So what can you do about it? This is the money shot here, right? Um, hardware security modules, that's the legacy solution. You put in this, this big custom-built box with custom software on it, and the vendor says, trust me. You remember what that means. Uh, they work great for one and one function only, keeping stuff locked away. They're dumb boxes. That's all they are. But we're taught HSMs are the answer. They've been the answer for the last 20 years. Uh, a couple of challenges there. One, HSMs were built for physical protection. So if you're using cloud-based services, um, it's kind of hard to take that box and to drop it on top of your cloud. Like, where, where are you going to put that thing? Uh, if you go with Amazon or Azure, you know, they have their own virtual HSM. Uh, I'll tell you a little secret. <clears throat> That's actually just a physical HSM that they over-provision and give you a slice of. So, AWS, for example, was using an HSM, vendor's HSM, that had code in it that allowed you to export keys that were marked as non-exportable from a remote location. It was network enabled. Right? So you're basically saying, I'm going to use this big piece of hardware, but I'll let someone else manage the keys to my kingdom. That, that's awful. You know, what, would you, for example, sign up for an email account and then give the password to your kids and say, you can only access your email when your kids type in the password and you trust your kids won't tell their friends. I don't mean to call Amazon kids, but, but um, you know, that, that's one of your options, these HSMs. But they were really built for physical protection. So you'll hear about FIPS 140-2, levels 1, 2, and 3, and 4 for government stuff. And folks will say, well, you know, is that thing FIPS 140-2, level 3, certified? Level 3, the big barrier is that you have to provide protection against certain emissions, physical emissions, and tamper-proofing. Um, does that make sense in a cloud-based world? I mean, how are you going to protect against emissions when you have a container running in, in Azure? Uh, vaults, those are the big solution now. Vaults, they, they, you put your secrets in them, they get sealed, and you can't get to them until they're unsealed. And that's great, except that they require cryptographic services. Every single one of the vaults that you see out there require an HSM behind them to do the sealing and unsealing. Otherwise, the crypto keys around the sealing and unsealing are exposed. So you're just adding another component. Esoteric protection schemes, one that you're hearing a lot of, because everyone follows the buzz phrases, right? Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, moving target. That's a huge one. So that's an example of it. We don't keep your key in one place. We're constantly juggling it. Nobody will find it. In the end, when you use a key to encrypt or decrypt something, it has to be somewhere at that point of use. It doesn't matter if it's a microsecond, a millisecond, a year, a day, a month, a week. It's in a spot. In computer time, that's forever and a day if it's in a spot and can be accessed. Uh, key management as a service, um, sort of the same thing as, the, as the, the virtual HSMs. I mean, again, you're depending on somebody else to, to protect your data. Um, code signing as a service, cloud HSMs, virtual HSMs, software-defined cryptography, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I got the four-minute mark. Um, the, the key there, <laughs> pun intended, is that you want whoever the vendor is to provide some sort of proof of security. The fact that, that they can show you 
under what conditions you're secure, under what conditions you're not secure, um, that's important. That's incredibly important. Those are the questions to ask. And so it's at this point that I'll open up to questions in case folks don't have questions. We threw some up, uh, up there. Um, so feel free to re reuse those. You know, what about quantum computers? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> no, please. Questions? We do bar mitzvahs. <laughs> Nope. Just, while, while, while you think it over, just to, to bring things full circle on the theme, you know, Alan made these comments around perimeter-based security, which is castle and moat. We've, we've moved on, hopefully moved on from that, to the notion of protecting data and data instances everywhere in the cyber world, right? Uh, this is really important when we talk about the idea of offering not just security, but also usability. How do we mm -hmm. access and offer systems in a way that is also secure, right? We, um, since this is the afternoon session, we have some, some chocolates to motivate you because no one was raising their hands for, for questions. We, uh, we work for an Israeli company. They're very proud of their, their taste in chocolate. So if anyone wants an afternoon pick-me-up, please uh, let us know. Um, or ask a question. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing uh, sock puppets for the next uh, four minutes. two minutes. Oh, four minutes. <laughs> That's a great question. So the, the question was around protection or encryption of data at rest in data centers, uh, but ultimately data needs to be used, right? It's not gonna sit encrypted forever and ever. Um, and there are two parts to this, right? If we think about modern applications in general, you have some data store, so you know, uh, it, it could be based in RDBMS, it could be based in, uh, in, in uh, non-relational databases, it could be based in uh, uh, non-indexed data, whatever. Um, and then the application needs access to that data for a specific function. For example, you want to check out, uh, you know, through the ATM how much money you have. You, you put in, you know, your PIN code, and then we grab the data from the database and we, we show it to you. Um, data needs to be protected at rest, in transit, and use. So how do we do that? Well, uh, the vast majority of those database-based applications tend to uh, rely mostly on. Uh, access of the data. So uh, if you think about the CRUD model, you're, you're not creating or, or changing, updating, or deleting it. It's literally just a read, a get, right? Uh, or select in the SQL uh, context here. So uh, it is possible to use tools that enable you to do that. For example, homomorphic encryption, fully homomorphic encryption is a technology that's really starting to take off. Um, the challenge with these technologies is that they lived in academia, um, theoretically wonderful in practice, required a lot of, of computing power, but we've gotten to the point now where they've been um, accelerated algorithmically rather than by tricks. So if you think about how you can accelerate applications, you're either throwing memory at it or CPU at it or improving your code. Uh, for example, Intel SGX, right? They thought, here's a secure enclave, I'm putting stuff in there and we're gonna be brilliant, we'll make it work fast by doing speculative branching. That didn't work so well. So homomorphic encryption is a great example of where using algorithmic methods in order to, uh, to enhance the, the access to the data and it allows you effectively to get the data without having to decrypt it and use it for certain functions or at least to search through data. Um, there's format preserving and order preserving encryption. There's uh, tokenization. Tokenization is a huge, huge uh, field these days, although they're, again, like anything else, good ways and bad ways to tokenize. So at rest is probably the least of your worries. Capture of the data in transit or in use uh, through compromised systems, I would worry about that much, much more. Great question, thank you. So Anybody else? We've got time for just one more. So, so the question was uh, in this slide where we were talking about the limitations in each of these systems um, and I was all gloom and doom and the answer is you should retire. No, um, so, so the answer is it, it, it all depends, right? It depends on your environment and your context. There are cases where an HSM makes a ton of sense. So for example, where you have um, uh, badges, you know, access badges and identity badges that can be spun up by HSMs, you know, that's great. They're typically centralized in a secured location in a locked room and people go through these, these uh, key ceremonies where they wear hoods and they light candles and you know that everything's okay. Um, for the cloud-based services, HSM's not so good. Uh, 
So that's where you now have to take a look at uh, how can I protect my key access. You have mechanisms or solutions like CASBs that allow you to do client-side encryption so you're not dependent on the provider. And this is where it gets to something that Alex mentioned a second ago, uh, this concept of friction versus security, right? We want to make something secure, but if you increase the level of friction, folks are going to just circumvent it. They'll start using Dropbox. They'll start emailing stuff out through Gmail. They'll start you know, printing stuff out. So we need to make sure that it's as usable as possible within your security constraints. So, so uh, you know, with the cloud-based providers, you can have a database as a service, like with Azure, you click a button that says encrypt this, and you're done. You're now using their KMS and their HSM. That's not the ideal choice, but it's better than nothing. Right? And, and this is where we deal with the better than nothing. Um, we happen to come from a company that has a software-based uh, or software-defined crypto uh, virtual HSM. It's FIPS 140-2, levels 1 and 2 certified. We can't get level 3 because we can't prove that the bits that we have aren't emitting when they're in the cloud um, and that you can't open up the cloud and look at stuff. So we're, we're working on that. Um, but there's another example, and it's not just us. I mean, you know, I'm a vendor, so I have to hawk my stuff. Um, but there are a handful of vendors out there that are, that are dealing with unique solutions. If you look at the cryptocurrency world, they, they, they have the idea of custodianship and multi-signature. So, so in this case, it's an administrative function, having multiple users approve of a given crypto function. In this case, you know, delivering uh, cryptocurrency to somebody. In, in our case, we do it in a different way. We're not providing multiple keys to people. We're using uh, something that's called secure multi-party computation that's algorithmically based. So, so in the end, it's going to come down to the best um, security you can provide based on your budget and your needs. Um, in general, we're, we're you know, moving down this list rather than sticking to the top of this list. The vaults and the HSMs and the esoteric protection schemes are probably your worst choices except in specific cases. The key management in virtual HSMs are probably you know, the future of what you're looking at, but clearly there are, there are caveats. You, you, you need to ask the questions about who has access to my keys. If I move from Azure to AWS, right, does my key come with me? What about those five years of backups? Aren't my keys in those five years of backups? Do you guarantee you're going to destroy them? Right, these are the questions you have to ask. So Unfortunately, we don't yeah, have enough time. I'm getting right. the hook. So, so, so I was just going to say real quick, bottom line is if you want to have a conversation about how to map your use case to a technical fit, then we can do that. We'll hang out for a minute and get our contact information. We loved, we loved giving this talk. We love educating the market. Uh, we, we only get invited a, a back upon good remarks. It was a personal request from Bob and Lois that everyone fills out the survey for every session, but especially, especially this uh, session. Sales are down. I need to buy groceries. <laughs> Please, please think please, of the children. Please, 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 uh, just let us know what you thought of this talk, if it was helpful, and and the constructive criticism is especially helpful because we're always looking for areas to improve. So big thanks to everyone who hung with us. Thanks to to Bob Lois and the entire staff who put this thing on. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen and uh, Alex.